Hello and welcome to my retro watches. Now this is not your typical restoration video from start to finish. This is more akin to what I did on the channel back in the early days. It's rebuilding a watch movement as a guide or as a bit of a tutorial for anybody out there who's trying to struggle with this particular movement. Now this is a Seiko 5246A. It is actually a high beat Seiko often found in some King Seiko's back in the 70s. This one came to me um, as a donor watch actually. I rebuilt a really nice version of this watch for a friend of mine called Craig Hen. Uh, his watch came in parts and then he had this donor movement as well. Uh, I had to make one good watch out of the two and I was allowed to keep the remainders. So in typical Mike Bolton fashion uh, I have to then try and make a watch for myself and I figured I'd film it, show you the oiling points and some of the uh, trip hazards that are in this movement. Now, if you are following along to this from the start, then please be aware I have left in some mistakes. So if you're copying them as I go along, then you will also make the mistakes. So be sure to always watch five or 10 minutes ahead of yourself uh, if you are going along to this movement. So let's get stuck into it. Uh, there won't be too much narration. Just gonna tell you what the name of the parts are, maybe what the oil are maybe the odd comment here and there. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you. For the center jewel, we've got Mobius 9010, just a little tiny bit there, so we can put the center wheel into place. Just going to oil the barrel arbor here with D5. And turn it the other way around to sit in to position. This is my version 1A auto oiler. And you just put it in one of the jewels. We've got two sort of cap jewels here one for the escape and one for the bottom pivot of the balance wheel. You fit it into position and you just lift the lever and it leaves the perfect amount of oil behind. That's a bit of D5. This is the hacking lever, which is quite an interesting thing. It actually operates from the back of the stem rather than in the uh, sliding clutch. And the first of the springs. And this one obviously holds that hacking lever under some tension. You always think they're going to fly off at this point, but you've got to have faith and move your tools away at some point. Mobius 9010 on the top of the center wheel. It has its own little bridge here, as you can see. Two screws. Just test that the uh, wheels are still turning. Ninety ten again. We have the center seconds pivot, which is its own little thing. Then we've got the train of wheels to go in. Notice how the first one has four spokes and then this one has five spokes and that's how you can easily identify which one goes where. I am actually following along also on a service manual which is a 5206A which you can find on my website. There will be a link below to that manual as well. 
So this is a little lever or spring that goes on that center seconds pivot. And um, it's a little pesky thing. It has to fit in a certain way. It has to sort of scoop just under the uh, teeth or the gearing on that. And it's easily uh, getting wrongable. Is that the right word? <laughs> you can easily get it wrong. It's held in by one screw, and when you screw it, it lifts that pinion up a bit. So there you go. You can just see I'm just sliding it over or underneath the bottom part. It's the first time I made this movement, I did it completely wrong. That's on my my friend's one, and I had to take it apart. What basically happens if you don't get that right is your sweeping second hand Damn it. will kind of tick and judder. This screw is not as easy as it looks because, again, you can quite easily knock everything out of place. And it's a big screw for just a small little thing. And I'm just checking now, make sure that that is installed correctly. And again, you can see how it lifts it up. So a little bit of D5. Now I could oil these from the opposite side. This is all part of the uh, uh, auto works. So this is what's winding or transferring the power from the rotor down to the bottom side of the barrel. So it's a Seiko uh, before the magic fingers, um, well, is it before the magic fingers actually? I think it may have been at the same time. So it's a little bit more complex in a way. Here's a train wheel bridge, the two brass bushed um, items you can see there are again the opposite shock jewels. So out comes the uh, 1A oiler again, and hopefully, you can see a little bit closer now how I do it. A little button on the side you just lift that up and let it go and there we are they've already been off and cleaned and reinstalled before I did that by the way bit of D5 this is for the setting lever it's not really a screw setting lever pin you sort of push that little dot in the middle there when you want to release the stem Can be a horrible train wheel bridge this one. And believe me when I say I'm not pressing down, it might be my finger, but I'm not pressing down hard at all. But I'm happy with what we're getting, so we'll get some screws into position. really is a lovely movement this a bit more challenging um, but like I say it is a high bit movement it had a lovely escape wheel I should have mentioned that really um, all the gear ratios will be different to give it that high beat and with high beat the aggressively comes a bit more accuracy it's got a coding there on the top I've been told that each of these movements is numbered I don't know whether it's that number necessarily because there is another number on the movement somewhere and if I see it in this rebuild I will point it out. This is another little bridge that fits on top of that train wheel bridge and again that's just for those uh, pivots for the auto works. And the tiniest of screws, these are the smallest screws on the movement and they're slightly sort of dome topped as well just to make it a little bit more difficult when you're screwing them in. It's quite easy for the screwdriver to slip out of those. A 
Now we're oiling the train wheel pivots on the dial side in preparation for more parts to be fitted because we cannot put the balance on this one not for quite some time yet we've still got to get all the keyless works involved so this here is going to be a bit of D5 onto the centre wheel in preparation for the cannon pinion Should get a reassuring click. And that's part of the uh, winding mechanism. Now it's time for the blue grease. This is Mobius 9504. It's new to me. I have got the Seiko uh, S4 grease, but I found that just a bit too annoying to apply. Now look closely at that clutch, certainly the opposite end with the sort of spiky teeth, and it's all covered in Rodico. And trust me, I never noticed at all, not until I came to edit this video. That is the click one screw so yes the uh, the clutch I'm gonna to have to remove at a later date and clean because I can't live with it being as it is but for now you'll have to bear with us uh, a bit more grease there into the clutch um, trying to mask that Rodico perhaps all these other pivot points here on these posts it's all Mobius D5 there's quite a lot of components that go into the keyless works on this one bit of over oil in there and this is the longest yoke in the world uh, it's got a great big spring on the tail end that fits into the case or into the main plate as you will see now let's test the action on that and now we have the setting lever most unusual setting lever you will have seen just making sure it's in that slot in the stem so it fits properly a bit more grease a lot of grease in fact and that's on that little post there which is for the setting lever spring which I'll be fitting in just a moment Okay, so if you're following along, that is one of my first mistakes. I won't notice I've just made a mistake for a few more moments, but I have all the same. So watch with interest. So here we go, I'm going to try and put that set-in lever spring over that post. So then that should actuate into all three positions. And as you can see, the yoke has jumped out of position. I don't notice that and continue to put a little bit more grease in places and then try again now the stem wants to come out and you can see it's all over the place so put the yoke back in again and then I realize there we go I've put the screw in the wrong hole <laughs> not for the first time either Should now work yes all I see though is Rodico <laughs> and it's really annoying again a bit more D5 
Okay, there's the minute wheel. Just gotta make sure it's all meshing. Which it is. And another little pesky spring, although not too difficult to fit this one. Just slots into that little recess. And it just controls or puts some tension onto that little gear there. This is all how it transfers the manual wind uh, from the crown to the mainspring so we'll just fit the ratchet wheel three slots on the screw means it's a left-handed thread go finally found its thread bit of pegwood just to hold it and give it that extra bit of tightness this is the minute wheel bridge it's also got an extra wheel on that which will be later on for the calendar works and I found these things all have to be fitted in a sequence as well on this particular watch. If you don't put this part on now, uh, if you carry on with the build, you won't be able to put it on later. Sits on two posts. It's got a little wheel at the base there as well. And again, that's all to do with the hand wind part. This is going to be for the, the date wheel itself. It's a little click for that to hold it in place every time the uh, date changes over. And that actually sits on a little post. I've moved it completely out of position there and I don't even realize. So again, another mistake. Uh, I will obviously rectify that later. You can kind of see in that zoomed up shot there that it's not quite right. Interesting little part this one goes on there as you can see we're trying to hand wind uh, it's also connected then to that square cutout on the setting lever and then finally we've got this little cover plate to hold it all in place along with a big hair this time I actually saw it well, after when I'm filming, I don't see those. Two screws for this uh, as well. Or D5. That there's the date driving wheel. So this is all responsible 
for your watch changing over at 12, changing the date that is. And that's the intermediate date wheel, which is kind of two wheels combined. It's got a tooth wheel underneath and then one on the on the top there also. And that's the date cam jumper and then this is the date jumper spring and this is a huge spring that requires one heck of a lot of tension. And realistically I should have think should have just put a little bit of oil on the heel there where the spring hits the part but it doesn't say it actually in the manual and that's the date jumper spring guard if you like there's more screw holes on this than there are screws so I'm following the instructions of the manual three screws more D5 quite a few parts still to go on for this uh, date changing mechanism it's quite a detailed one so that's the cam to start with Then we've got the date wheel finger and here's another mistake I put it on like that the actual slot should go out over the post that I oiled a minute ago that um, it's next to so it should have gone over that I will of course rectify that in a moment when I realize and then this one is the day finger which I have installed correctly or nearly so they both will in sync turn the uh, day and the date and jump them over at exactly the same time quite often on Seacoves that doesn't happen and here we go I'm trying to put the hour wheel on and then now realizing that I've got everything wrong and that most of that keyless part's got to come out uh, along with all the fingers in order to get it right which was a real pain in the backside I should have thought ahead and I didn't um, so don't again follow my mistakes now you can see I've installed it correctly and I'm back with that uh, date finger over that post and then the day finger but yes that hour wheel needs to go on pretty much as soon as you've put the minute wheel in and that way you won't have the problem that I had so that's the date wheel and that's just going to click into place the guards to hold it all in place this one here is quite critical in the sense that it's got a brass screw it's the only brass screw and it has to be located there now the other plate or the other cover for the rest of the works Now we can just test that. And here you can see the day finger going around that cam. 
and suddenly release with the tension of that giant spring so see how it sort of winds itself yes. really really cool mechanism i have to say so now we know it's going to be all right we can put on the date wheel of uh, the day wheel sorry and i just use a, an old oiler just to engage that spring over the gear underneath it and then again double check to make sure it's still working which it is and then I can finally so the moment of truth And she's away. Away indeed. I think uh, that balance is swinging quite nicely. Certainly high beats. They do look like they're spinning rather fast. This is a 28,800 beats per hour. So let's put it on the time grapher and show you the results of all that hard work. Here we go absolute lovely in that position which is dialed down uh, you can see everything is pretty much as good as it's going to get however once we start moving it around a bit you can see that we are losing a bit of time but we'll test it in all the other positions in a way so a slight improvement there minus nine seconds Realistically, you could regulate a bit more of this out as well, I think, from positional variance uh, to accommodate for some of that. There we are. That's dial up at six seconds. I'm going to call it a win either way. That is very good for nearly a 50 year old watch. High beat especially. I always think that these possibly wear a bit more than the lower beat watches, should we say. Fit the hands and then I can finally show you the finished watch fitting the hands here on my new hand press tool aliexpress special that's a hundred pounds whereas the version is a thousand pounds i think it does a really good job comes down nice and square makes the job a little bit easier so generally pleased with that investment so now that's done time to show you the finished watch so here it is the finished watch and that is so seiko 70s that two-tone dial with the stripe down the middle really reflects a light pretty cool i've got a few seikos like this already now this one did come in a gold case and that gold case was corroded like i've never seen before it's almost like somebody's had some acid sweat uh, to make it as bad as it was but I was very fortunate because the original watch that I did for Craig, he'd got a new old stock case, but he'd also got this stainless steel case, which I was able to use for this watch. All I had to do was source a stem and a crown, which was quite easy to do. So the end result is, uh, well, I think it's absolutely magnificent. Um, I put it on a Milanese strap, which I think it looks really nice you would think that a brown leather strap would go well with this and i did put it on it but when i do a shot on the wrist i just doesn't it doesn't suit it for some reason i think it's because the case is such an interesting uh style that it doesn't really go with a strap what do you think leave your comments below this watch has got some quite interesting sizing you might think it's quite big um but it is in actual fact only 34 millimeters can you call it a diameter i don't know across 40 millimeters lug to lug and it's only 9.5 millimeters thick so a proper seiko dress watch uh, really really nice and i'm really pleased with the end result and to actually add this also to my collection watch is now on the microscope at 120 frames per second aim is to slow it down so you can count the eight beats per second you get 
on this high beat movement. It is quite wonderful, but you have to watch very closely. So starting from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here we are back at 60 frames per second, non flickering screen, and you can see how smooth that ticket is. Not quite Boulevard Accutron, let's face it, but it's pretty decent all the same. And I do like a smooth tick. I don't know about you. So, uh, as always with my videos, I really do hope you have enjoyed this one. Whether you were just watching it for fun or whether you've been following it along, please bear in mind that obviously I've made a few mistakes. There was a few over oils as well. Um, but at least it gives you a, an idea and a guide of the part placement, where things go and the order of which to, to build the watch as well. Leave your comments below. I read every single one of them. I'll try to reply to as many as I can. Uh, if you want to support the channel in some way, well, uh, head on to my website. There's a link below. There's a tool page there. All affiliates. You can buy watchmaking tools that I either use or would recommend. Uh, that way I get a little bit of kickback as well. Um, don't forget to check me out on Instagram. My Retro Watch is over there. Uh, Facebook group. Uh, link again is below. And if you want to see watch reviews, then I would love it if you'd come over to my new channel, My Watch Reviews. I review watches like this, some of my own collection, along with some new ones as well. So you're welcome over there anytime. So please go and check that out. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I will see you very soon in the next video. Bye for now.